Eighth edition of the Rising uh, Dialogue. Let's listen. In doing so, no country can strive to strengthen its security at the expense of the security of others. And then another principle was signed by the presidents and the prime ministers, uh, according to which no country and no organization in the OSC region can pretend to dominate militarily. If you, if you uh, read it again, it's clear that NATO violated uh, all these commitments. By the way, it was in 1999, and then it was repeated in 2010 at another OSC summit in, in uh, Kazakhstan. And when we started to ask questions, guys, you committed yourself not to increase your security at the expense of our security. Uh, can you stop expanding NATO? They said, well, this is just political condition. But, Minister, what, what wait does, a second, what does wait the Wait a second, wait a second. If, <laughs> look, if you ask the question which I'm trying to answer, that means that you don't know what I'm telling you now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so when we, we said, okay, you said this is political commitment, let's make it, let's make it a legal uh, uh, commitment, let's put all these principles in a legally binding treaty, indivisible security. You know what they told us? They said, you know, uh, legally binding guarantees of security can only be obtained inside NATO. Just looking into our face. We told them, look, President Obama signed this particular paper. Well, this is political commitment, forget about this. And then uh, there was another legally binding commitment, uh, I mean uh, the resolution of the Security Council, which endorsed the Minsk agreements. It was uh, very, very astonishing that all those who signed the Minsk agreements, except Putin, publicly admitted that they never intended to implement this particular Security Council resolution. So, uh, not, no delivery on the oral commitments, no delivery on written commitments, no delivery on legally binding commitments. And all this was accompanied by NATO instructors beefing up Ukrainian army, uh, Ukraine getting more and more weapons, as uh, Merkel, Hollande, Poroshenko and Zelensky said, we needed the Minsk agreements to buy some time to get more and more weapons to Ukraine. And uh, if you can check the reports of OSC special monitoring mission, they registered sharp increase uh, of the shelling of Donbass uh, just in the beginning of February, 20, 30 times more than the routine exchange of fire uh, before that. So we, we defended our security, we defended the people, the Russian people, who had been denied by Poroshenko and Zelensky, uh, denied uh, the right to use the Russian language in education, in media, in culture, in everything. If you check the Ukrainian legislation passed after the coup uh, brought to power this neo-nazist regime, they cancelled legally, cancelled everything what, what has to do with the Russian language. And when the people who did not accept the coup in the east of Ukraine and in Crimea said, guys, leave us alone, we are not going to, to follow your, uh, your policies. They were declared terrorists. And it is the regime who started the war against these people. That's why the Minsk agreements were uh, considered, you know, uh, the way to stop this. And it was not very difficult to implement the Minsk agreements. It was about the special status for a small part of the east of Ukraine much smaller than the territory which is controlled by the Russian army now, much smaller. <clears throat> but they didn't want to do this because the special status to be given to this, to this small territory included the right to use the Russian language. And this in itself was considered a taboo by the nazis who took the power in Ukraine uh, through a coup. Then there was the right to have some uh, local police 
which is nothing uh, unusual, uh, and then the right to be consulted when judges and uh, uh, prosecutors are appointed for this particular region. By the way, this is exactly almost, almost the same status as was promised to Kosovo Serbs in 2013, a year before, two years before the Minsk agreements, uh, this community of Serbian municipalities of Kosovo. The same stuff and the same trick. Cheating on Serbia in case of a community of Serbian municipality of Kosovo, cheating on Russia in the case of the Minsk agreements. Special status for the Serbs in Kosovo, special status for Russians in Ukraine. In both cases it was the European Union in the person of uh, Germany and France, uh, and also the high representative uh, regarding the Kosovo deal. And they, I am, I am convinced that just like they admitted that they did not intend to implement the Minsk agreements, they never intended to implement the uh, thing they promised the Serbs in Kosovo. Uh, but I, the war, I, I uh, think this, I this, stop this here. military campaign or whatever you call it, a war or enduring freedom operation, whatever name you may choose to call it, the bombing campaigns do not alter hearts and minds. They are the worst way to do it. In fact, they freeze people into positions, make further May negotiations I, even okay, more difficult. Okay, 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 so okay. where does this take us? Yeah, yeah tell me, tell me uh, when this uh, conference started, what year? Uh, this is the eighth, you know, eighth, eighth, one, eighth Reisner Dialogue we are having. Eight years. Eight, so yeah. You started in 2014 or something? Yeah, some, yeah. <coughs> uh, have you been interested uh, during these years uh, what is going on in Iraq, what is going on in Afghanistan? Have you been asking the United States and NATO whether they are... Uh, whether they are... Uh, certain of what they are doing, when, when are they uh, now, uh, Scholz, uh, um, um, Baerbock, uh, Macron and others say, this is the first time when the OSC Helsinki final act is being violated. They don't remember about 1999 when Serbia was bombed, when, when uh, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, uh, being a senator at that time, uh, he was bragging that I, one year before the uh, bombing of Serbia, I uh, promoted this approach, and I believe that we have to bomb them out into peace. Uh, when when uh, Iraq was ruined as a state, uh, after Colin Powell showed a vial with some powder, and then a few years later Tony Blair said, yes, it was a mistake, what to do? No, but that is a lesson uh, which wait needs a to second, be learned. Wait a second, you, if you believe that the United States has the right to declare a threat to its national interest, any place on earth, like they did in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, 10,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean and they have the right to do so and you don't ask them any questions and Russia not just overnight like they did in Iraq and uh, elsewhere but for more than 10 years warning them guys you are doing something which is going to be very bad but I think and the question not, has not, been asked one second one second not across the ocean but just on our borders on the territories where the Russians lived for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, if it is not a double standard, then uh, I am not a minister, you know. <laughs> the question has been asked, and I, I, the, the experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, everywhere has been that it does not make sense to get into these long protracted wars to defend these kinds of interests. US did not succeed, why do you think Russia will succeed? 